and not hitting the ball so hard. And one of the things you can convince yourself that it's right is to think about not spinning it as much. This is Playing Lessons from the Pros, Managing Your Game. Presented by the Ace Group. There's a lot of little subtleties to this game to where you can actually be a good player day in and day out, and it's not just having a good golf swing and a decent putting stroke. So I think, you know, get out and learn it. You know, get around the greens and try a lot of different shots and ask good players. Observe good players and what they do in certain situations, and you'll be a better player. Mark Brooks has made a healthy living in this game for better than 15 years, riding a wave of success right into the era of the power hitter. He is a hard-boiled Texan, to be sure, a bit like Ben Crenshaw in that he is not a burly guy or a big hitter, a little bit like Bruce Litsky in that he favors a particular type of shot. In Mark's case, he likes that right-to-left action. Mark Brooks is an old-school shot maker with a type of game that really never seems to go out of style. The emphasis is on creativity and accuracy. And keep in mind, Mark nearly won the 2001 U.S. Open, losing in a playoff to Retief Goosen. Fittingly, this playing lesson took place in his hometown of Fort Worth, Texas, at Ben Hogan's former club, Shady Oaks. After a ho-hum wedge to a couple of feet and an easy conversion on the 10th hole, we eavesdrop on the par 3 12th with Mark Brooks. Well, it's just a beautiful par 3, and actually they left you a place to bounce the ball in if you need to. It's really blowing hard downwind. You know, you could, there's times I've hit four or five irons here you know, from 2.30, and, you know, play it kind of at that right bunker and, try and hit a hook in there and let it run on the green. I've also played here into the wind and hit driver, so. Uh, what I try to do on a hole like this, you know, is not try to aim particularly right at the pin. Uh, I mean, I will try to get lined up really good for where I want the ball to start and make sure I hit it solid. I mean, a hole like this, the most important thing is that you hit it solid and, you know, maybe try to make sure you carry that front left bunker. generally what I did. Now if it carries the front, it'll be good. And it didn't. Needed about four more steps and it would have been perfect. I'm by no means one of the best putters. I mean, I'm a good putter, occasionally streaky, but uh, you, you kind of know which putts you, you know, maybe you're not putting as well, right to left, left to right. And uh, so that can occasionally uh, have some consideration on where you're going to leave your putt. Uh, you know, you'd think being a hooker, I'd end up with a lot of left to right putts. And it's kind of, you know, that part is fairly true. You end up missing the pin left of the pin a lot, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet, and most greens slope back to front. So if you're left of the hole on a tradi regular old traditional green, you're, you're going to have a lot of left to righters. Um, but one of the things I try to do on, on reading putts, I guess, actually, I, I'll go back to Ben Crenshaw gave me a great tip at Augusta probably 12 years ago or 15 years ago when I first played there. And he said to make sure that you make your mistakes on the high side, meaning, you know, right to left putt. If I'm going to miss misread the putt or make a mistake, he's talking about when the ball's rolling. Play too much break opposed to playing too little break. And one of the reasons I, he would say that is you can be a little more aggressive on a higher line. You start a little more up the slope. And if you've misread a putt, especially just like this one right here, if I read, let's say, a foot not enough break or two feet not enough break, hit it a little too hard, all of a sudden I've got the thing kind of racing down the line. So a lot of times it's not just because the guy's, you know, it's, it, the putter went off in his hands. He might have misread it and he pulled it a little bit. And next thing you know, the thing's racing down the hill. So great example. One of the things I do is, I'll try to look and I try to look and see what is obviously not enough break. And in this case, you know, a couple of feet's not even close. You can just kind of see, picture it running if you played it, you know, a couple of feet out and you can see that thing's going to end up 10 feet below the hole. So I'll start looking up till I can find the highest place that I want to start the ball. And I do I do sort of 
spot putt. Uh, I'll kind of look, I'll try to find something to get the ball to roll past. Uh, in this case, you know, I see a piece of grass up there that's 12 feet above the hole probably, maybe more. And I'll try to let the ball finish just under that, which is about my start line. So it's kind of hard to believe this putt would break that much, even though it probably won't. And try to get the speed. It went just under the piece of grass. So I probably overread that a little bit, but it's certainly not racing away. Now, if you stood down there, which is a great example, if I can find where I was standing here, probably about right there. And that ball is really almost exactly behind the hole. This is another one of the many lessons we've gotten. And I looked at that piece of grass from the tee and did a line extended to the hole. That's probably pretty close. It's actually right there. And you think you'd read that much break when you read that putt? Huh? Let's see what you're saying. From the tee to there. So what I try to do is I, I've looked first right in here and realized that's obviously not a break just from the visual watching the ball go by. But it's pretty hard to believe that from 30, 30 feet or so, you'd play seven or eight feet of break. And had I gotten the speed, you know, speed just right, I actually ball had a good chance to go in. So that's my, one of my putting reading tips of the day. Well, that's the kind of insight that you can really only get from a touring professional, handed down from none other than Ben Crenshaw, who's made a few putts in his day, hasn't he? Still to come, how in the world do you get out of this mess? Here, I'm going to be a square to slightly closed, and stay still. Try to go all upper body. Playing lessons from the pros, managing your game. Presented by the Ace Paula in all. He was able to earn a berth on the President's Cup team. Now let's rejoin Mark and your playing lesson. Mark's at a par five, facing his third shot. I mean, this shot's really not that complicated. The green's not that hard. I'm not sitting in deep rough. Obviously, I've got a really good lie here. I'm just going to try to go up in the air and, uh, you know, tournament conditions. You hate to say it, but you'd probably fudge to the left side a little bit here. And uh, just in case it came out a little funny, didn't carry the bunker. I mean, that's pretty obviously the last place you want to be. And from here, you could even end up with a funny line in the bunker, so as in plugged or something against the lip. So we've got about 50 yards, so that's kind of what the rehearsal's for and to see what the grass feels like. But, of course, here, now that ball's sitting halfway up. I'm going to try to not get too deep on it, meaning too steep and under it. That's when you get the one that bloops. So I'm going to try to stay nice and level here and try to do about a 48-yard pitch in the bunker. That's exactly what you don't want to do right there. Oh, a little bit of a deceleration. That was a little bit decelled, meaning I just not aggressive enough through the shot. So, but I, the problem is that's the power of suggestion. I just talked about that. I pictured it and then my body did it. So again, more reasons for not having negative thoughts. That's a, almost exactly what you'd picture not wanting to do. So I wouldn't really think about that much. And I, I guess it brings me to another tip. Yeah. Shots like this, even shorter, 20 yard, 30 yard. One of the great things to aim at is the top of the flag. Picture a basket on top of the flag or a you know basketball hoop or something. If you try, that's a good place to aim. Even if you're around the green playing the flop shots, if being short is going to be bad, pick something that's you know you always say well pick past the hole. Now I like to think about dropping it right straight down on top of the flag. And will you do it? Not very often, but at least it's a great visual. And if I miss, maybe I'll miss a little long. It gets your vision up too, away from the trouble. And I didn't hit it hard enough again, but it worked out. So that's a good, good target, I think, on a lot of shots. Real tough bunker shot or real tough flop shot out of the rough. Pick something up high, and maybe the top of the flag is a great place to aim. It's just 
not a very athletic or good position. It's probably not even good for your back to be in this position and try to make a hard swing. So the better way is by widening. Occasionally, you might have to widen and bend over, but at least you got a better stable base. So on this buried lie, and you got to decide, I'm obviously, I'm not going to hit the ball first here, like you don't eat in a regular bunker shot. So I'm going to try to look probably somewhere right around there, which is probably about three inches behind the ball. I'm going to try to keep this club face square to almost closed because I want it to dig in and get underneath the golf ball. Obviously, I'm not going to spin it. I don't have high expectations on this shot, more than getting just out of the bunker. But the main thing is to get out. The main thing is to not bury it worse than it is. So the reason I'm closing that club face is so it's got a little more dig. And if anybody looks at their wedge, if you close it, you've got a sharper cutting edge here than if you open it. If you open it up, it's much more dull and will tend to bounce up. That's when you'll hit a very ugly shot. So that's not going to work very well in this case. Here, I'm going to be able to square to slightly closed and stay still. Try to go all upper body. And I'm going to enter pretty firm here and several inches behind it. So I'm not looking at the golf ball. I'm trying to look back in here. So I'm not going to cover that spot up I'm trying to hit. And it came out. And if I get a kick, not bad. But it came out very easily from a, a very buried lie, and that's because it was able to cut underneath. Chance to save. Which does not register very high in the stats column on the PGA Tour these days. Where Mark does show up, however, is on the accuracy board, using that purposeful draw to his advantage. Now, as we head to the back nine at Shady Oaks in Fort Worth, Texas, you will find that Mark has a definite game plan on each and every hole and the shots to go with it. Dogleg left, par five. It's uh, sometimes it's a layup hole uh, off the tee, meaning layup three wood, and then you can still reach the green with the normal wind. Uh, today, you probably got a little bit out of the east, so that 280, 285 is going to play probably 300 or more. I'm going to try to kind of hit a draw down there, um, finish it in the left half of the fairway if I can. I haven't done one yet, but, and then about a four wood in, make three and get back up in this match. Turn over a little more, more in the middle. All right. I'm going to try to chase a three wood on. Chase golf lingo means low running shot. Even though it's wet, if it's low enough, it should still skid. Obviously, the bis is not hard left. play a little draw. That's the first one I've hit today I talked about hitting. Probably snuck up close to the front. Should be an easy four. Well, this is uh, similar but not near as much break as the one I had on about the 12th hole. A little uphill, same deal. I'm just going to find the high line. And I've kind of got a spot out there. I'm going to try to run it through. Might be a little too hard for that line. Easy four, though. And that's pretty much what you're trying to do on this hole. Just get a chance at a three if you can, and uh, I'll take it. Uh, this putter's probably all, just under 37 inches, and I, I just did it, uh, well, actually, I did it probably four or five years ago. 
went to a little bit longer putter, and maybe maybe eight years ago. Uh, and I did it because I wanted a little more weight. You know, I wanted the putter to be a little bit heavier. Uh, I felt like I was a little better from short short range with a heavier putter. And uh, I got to where I just couldn't stand a light putter. And uh, I'm sure it's nerves and age and all that. But, you know, just to you know, keep from being so bent over, hard on your back. And uh, I just went a little, a little longer, which by being a little longer, uh, it probably is going to be a little more upright. Got a, probably a eight, ten mile an hour breeze in. Uh, you know, I think generally you can add about ten yards here for the wind. There's a ridge uh, left of the pen, so probably perfect world. I'm going to finish it ten or twelve feet right of the hole. So I'm going to aim over there just inside the back right bunker and try to not really hit much of a hook. I am going to try to keep it down a little bit just for insurance over the water, over the front of the green. And I probably overturned it a hair. Stay right. This would probably give me a good spot for a tip. Okay. We don't have much wind, but there's a little bit of breeze here. Probably just enough to, to start having to play a little bit of the breeze, a little bit of the wind. You know, anything that's about five miles an hour under, you don't need to play, don't need to worry about too much. It's not going to really take you from a eight iron to a seven iron, per se. Uh, maybe unless you're a really, really, you know, high ball hitter. But when you're trying to hit a knockdown shot, which is what I'm trying to trying to hit here and people talk about it a lot one of the things I do especially being someone that draws the ball when you move the ball back in your stance which is one of the things that you, you know probably should do to get the trajectory down is that by being in swinging from the inside the more I have this ball back in the in my stance the earlier I'm gonna hit it in the downswing which means I'm gonna hit it have a tendency to hit it even more from the inside and by trying to hit it low there's a good chance that I'll hit it too much from the inside and have too close a club face at impact. And that's when you hit the low shot you kind of want, but it way over hooks. So trying to figure out you know, ways to combat that hook and not over hook when you're trying to hit a knockdown, I definitely agree with moving the ball back in your stance. And obviously the shorter the club, meaning the more loft it has, the more back I'll move it. But this would be a, a seven iron in this particular case. I'm going to definitely play this ball right of my sternum or try to get it right of the center. And now really the big trick besides moving the ball back is to try to get a little closer to the ball. I'll try to move in a couple of inches closer to the ball. Instead of being, let's say this is normal right here and my left foot was, you know, we'll mark a spot here. I'm going to actually move in a couple inches. And I'm going to be in here closer. And what this does is allows my swing to be a little more down the line and a little bit less, have a little less tendency to be too much from the inside. The only thing you have to watch is being too steep. So you still do a lot of the same things, but I've moved in closer. I've kept the ball back. I'm not going to swing 110%. And it does help seem to take some of the hook out. That ball drew just a little tiny bit. Still swung, ball was still, the club had still moved from the inside out, but not as, not as dramatically. And then the last thing I'm playing into the wind, I'll give you, is when you're playing into the wind, I like to think about being soft and not hitting the ball so hard. And one of the things you can convince yourself that it's right is to think about not spinning it as much. So when you're into the wind, take more club and swing a little softer. Try to be a little softer, a little less spin. The ball will penetrate the wind better. Conversely, downwind, you're in between clubs. Generally, you might be better off taking the shorter club and hitting it harder to try to get a little more spin on it and carry with the wind. So that's kind of my tip for the wind. Same deal here. I kind of have a line a couple feet in front of me. And I laid it up. Mercy. When playing lessons from the pros, managing your game continues. I like personally waggling the club head and probably a combination of the feet moving and waggling. Playing lessons from the pros, managing your game. 
presented by the Ace Group. Take away the risk, and you can do anything. Mark Brooks. Now, after a rare miscue right of the 17th fairway, our fair-haired Fort Worth native offers a few thoughts on the pre-shot routine as he prepares to pull off the shot maker's dream. I'm actually going to aim it, try to aim it over there almost to the left bunker and try to hit a big, big cut. And if it jumps a little bit and gets right of the pin, that's really no big deal here. I think it's very important not to get stationary too long. Very few players have ever been successful for a long period of time that got over the ball, finally your club's behind it, and then we're frozen. Uh, so keeping some kind of movement going, whether it's, you know, moving your feet a little bit or waggling. I like personally waggling the club head and probably a combination of the feet moving and waggling. Uh, so when you're working on a waggle or something that will help you start the swing, it should be a mini rehearsal of this takeaway or some thought of a kind of impact position. And if you'll do that on the right pace, and the right tempo, it will help your whole swing have a better tempo. Well, that's in the fairway. Let's go get them. You know, the game's about misses. I mean, you know, it's, and I think I've probably played that way, you know, for most of my career, even going back to amateur golf, uh, realizing this, you know, you're only going to hit a handful of really, really good shots. And I kind of laid the sod over it. Ugh. I mean, I felt like in that nine holes today, maybe two, you know, that I kind of pictured a shot and it came off pretty close to what I wanted. Uh, so that'd be fairly typical. You know, two or three out of uh, in nine holes, about it. Uh, so it really becomes a game of how good are your misses. I just had a little too much speed there. It wasn't quite as smooth as I needed to be. So if you don't have good ball control, then course management is pretty much a moot point throw out the window. Uh, course management, you know, obviously laying up in the right spot, aiming in the right direction. But if you don't know where it's going, forget course management. You know, you might as well tee it high and bash it and go see what you can shoot. But uh, for my own game, I think I've, I've strived on, uh, you know, trying to make sure our misses weren't too bad. And... Uh, that's not necessarily just going out and buying a bigger driver or, you know, some more forgiving club. It's just having a little better golf swing and uh, staying within yourself, you know, comfortably. Mark Brooks, a player of very solid pedigree, a three-time All-American at Texas and a professional major champion who's learned and shared with us the value of playing and staying within yourself. Mark also demonstrated to us that you don't need to be a big hitter, that it's important to have a variety of shots, the knockdowns, the chasers, the draws, the fades. Plus, we learned that you can occasionally put a little extra break on a putt so you have an easier second chance coming back. Thanks very much to Mark Brooks, and good luck with your game.